welcome to church today. It's lovely to see you all. I'm seeing more jackets and jumpers and even the odd scarf, Phil Mitchell, uh, on people today. Certainly it's been cool for a couple of days, but isn't it always good to know that when we come to church, there's kind of like this warmth of fellowship that we get to experience. I do hope that you do experience some of that today, whether you're here with us in the church or whether you're watching online. We're going to obviously during the course of the service today bring you four songs. The first one's a little bit upbeat to get some of that warmth happening. Why don't you join us as we sing My Redeemer Lives. Why don't you stand? but you could see them yeah, really into that. Thank you. Um, do you want to just bow your heads and we'll start with prayer? Dear God, we come together in your name. We're here to, uh, to worship you. And um, today, dear Jesus, we want to ask that you put a, a blessing on Merlene Yench as she comes up the front. If there's any nerves, may you calm them and may she... Uh, be able to bring forth the, all of that, that work she's put in to share with us today. And uh, may it go to strengthen, strengthen our hearts and our, our, our minds and our, our belief in you. And God, thank you for this community, for this church, that we can be together and um, have the freedom to worship you in 
your name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Morford Vale today. You may have picked up in the prayer that we're very lucky to have uh, Merlene Lynch, Yench here today and she's titled the sermon, The Transplant Ward. So we're going to explore a little bit of that later on and I'm, I think we're looking forward to that. Um, I want to welcome the people on live streaming as well and uh, those people who are perhaps visiting us here for the first time today. Welcome, special to you. Um, I've got a confession. I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not quite so sure. Where, where does decisions happen? I'm kind of giving you a hint. Which organ does the work? It's our brain. Or is it? Um, Uh, can you not put do my punchlines just yet? <laughs> um, thank you, Liz. That's really very true. That's very good. Uh, you are Hebrew scholars in the room. I've done the English sound of that Hebrew word. Um, what is it? I was wondering whether someone would actually get it. Lev. Lev is the Hebrew word for heart. The Israelites had a uh, broader view of what the heart was than we do in our uh, modern context. They thought of the heart as the organ that gives physical life. Sounds about right. And the place where you think and make sense of the world, where you feel emotions and make choices. So you now, I guess you can start seeing a bit of a picture of where that, that context of saying, thinking with your heart comes from, it goes all the way back to the Israelites and what they thought that organ did in your body. If you want to advance the slide. But we actually have, a, we have these three contexts of making decisions. And when you, we often use the term, well, you use your mind or you make a decision with your heart or you make a decision with your gut. And they're the three, I guess, different ways. Your mind is, I think, things through to understand them. Your heart, I feel and sense whether something is right. Or gut, I rely on my gut instinct, my personal experience, my, I just know. Do you know which one you favour? I guess we all, we all favour our own. It actually reminds me um, of a... We used to have a coach that came through our work and he used to run Nissan in Australia, so he's a pretty senior person. And um, as a young engineer, I knew that I used my brain to solve problems, work through it, choose the optimum and make my decision based on thinking. And he says, Andrew, no... Every decision you make is emotional. It doesn't matter if you think you've gone through that list. At the end of the day, it is that feeling, that choice that you make. And the strength and the importance of the heart part of the decision is really important. And the reason he was telling us that is because we were doing a lot of change management. And when you've got people who you want to bring from thinking this way to thinking a new way, he was highlighting the importance of pulling on the, the heart part of the choice. So you want to go, there's a few texts I pulled out. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Interestingly, and as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. With those two texts, one of the things that's really evident in there is I think this applies to all of us, whether you're a bias towards the mind way of making a choice or the heart or the gut feel, ultimately what's in your heart is what's going to come out in both um, of those examples. So I guess I just wanted to touch on that because today when we're going through the transplant ward, we're talking about the importance of the heart and so there was this, there's this text that we all would know, and it's the next one. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Of those three thinking processes in the Bible, which is the one that God's going to channel his way in to help us make the right choices? It's going to be through the heart. And it's that thinking process, I think, that is really, really important as a Christian. And I guess why it's so important we have our heart transplants. So we look forward to that later on. Um, there's a few people who wanted to quickly share some announcements. Uh, Edie, would you like to or come up? Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> well, no walks today. I think it's going to rain. <laughs> but I have an announcement to make about women's ministry, which will be happening uh, August the uh, 28th, 26th and 28th. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We come back in the afternoon. Uh, it'll be down at the Albinga Beach Holiday Park. We met there last year. It's really quite nice. Uh, a good area to walk in and, and scenery and for ladies to come and meet together. We, on speaking of meeting together and worshipping, um, we have our writer Ellen White say, even though there's a time of trouble, not to forsake ourselves meeting together. And she instructs us to come together and encourage each other. So women's ministry it'll be. Um, on the weekend of August 28 and 26. So come along because we'll have um, Doc, um, Dawn Grant Chabay coming and visiting us and it'll be a lovely time. So any um, applications, it is on uh, the sheet there that is around uh, the foyer or you can ama um, contact Amanda. So also, the other announcement is our pie drive. Okay, so winter's coming and put some nice pies in the freezer. Uh, our cooking will start on the 31st of July on a Sunday. So if anyone is willing to help, we'd be gratefully appreciated. And um, yeah, we'll have a good time. So um, anyone, any orders? There's some forms out, out the front, so we can fill them in and give them to um, Amanda and myself. That would be great. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Edie. Happy Sabbath, church. Are you all enjoying the colder weather? No? <laughs> I hear some no's. I'm certainly enjoying the first uh, proper winter uh, in my life in about five years, so it's great. Um, announcement that I want to make this morning is that Pastor Travis Manners is starting off a uh, prophecy seminar series entitled, obviously, Secrets of Prophecy. I think this church was doing a prophecy seminar series just before COVID came in, and then it kind of hit that in the middle there, and the rest didn't really happen. So uh, here we are uh, going for round two, and sort of um, attempting this again, I guess. Um, the opening night here in the flyer, it says that it'll be on um, Monday, 1st of August at 7 p.m. with the title of that presentation, Who Will Control the World and the Signs That uh, Jesus Is Coming. And then the series will continue um, on Wednesday, August the 3rd, Monday, August the 10th, Wednesday, August the 12th. And then after that, it's on Monday evenings only. And so this is a uh, new series that we're starting here in this church in the new school term. Um, best thing with these kinds of things is always to invite uh, your closest friends, the people that you know in your life that are interested in this and in your sphere of influence, and invite them to come along. Obviously, none of us are strangers to the fact that we are living in a crazy world, and so this gives us an opportunity to explore uh, what the Bible has to say about the things that are taking place around us and what God's ultimate solution is to the problem of sin. If any of you would like to have more information, it's in the church newsletter that Pastor Travis sends out. And of course, there are flyers at the, on the table out the back if you want to grab one on the way home and uh, grab one of these flyers and get the extra info. You're more than welcome to do that. Thank you.
Okay, and if you are on the way out and you're going to where the flyers are, just beside it there's a couple of letterbox-looking containers, therefore our offering. So if you would like to give today, the money's going to our local church to support the ministries that we do here. So um, if you do put money in, that's what it's uh, going to go for. And I will mention, of course, the e-giving. If you search e-giving and you'll see the SDA logo like that in either Google Play or Apple, whatever Apple is, um, you'll be able to uh, sign up and it's very easy to, to do your giving that way if you would like to. So, yeah, does, has anyone else noticed that? Have you looked up? So, uh, Ron and Shane have done a lot of work um, in the preparation for some, we got some people to come in and put the, uh, the downlights up this week. So, thank you. That's another thing that when you do put that offering in to support the local church, it helps to support those uh, projects that we do like that. So, thank you. That was actually a good segue. You, you've done all my talking for me today, Liz. It's great. All right. It's now time for the children's story, so I'll invite Danny up. Any children here today? Alrighty. Now, I don't have a clicker today, so it's going to be like fighting over the remote control at home because my son is going to be doing it up the back there and we'll probably go too fast. But anyway, we'll see how we go. Okay, what's that you can see on the screen? Love hearts, yes. Okay. Let's keep going. This love heart here shown was one of the first, the earliest love hearts that they ever made back in Roman times. And it was shaped because of a seed pod um, that they used of a particular plant, a giant fennel plant actually. And that the seed pod was shaped like a love heart. So they made, they actually put it on coins. So that was the first time they started using love hearts a long time ago. Okay. Then they started using them more in medieval times. This is a love heart shaped book. Uh, okay. And then in their art, you can see love hearts. All righty. Flying love hearts. And this guy's got a love heart in his hand and a sword. Not sure what he's doing there, but anyway. Then they moved on later in history and it became more, used more and more in, in, in art and in paintings and drawings. That one's on fire. Alrighty. Then um, they started using them in pictures of Jesus. They called it the sacred heart of Jesus. So <clears throat> that was quite common. Another one there. Then in Victorian times, they started using them on Valentine's Day cards. They loved their hearts in Victorian times. Love hearts. A whole lot of them there. So today we see love hearts everywhere. In, in drawings, paintings, mosaics, there's paper ones, knitted ones, cookies, biscuits, pizza ones, yeah. yeah, and you can even make ones out of your hands and take photos, okay, and there's a bunch of people doing it there, righty, now there's lots of companies that use them as their logo, some of them you might see actually are to do with the heart in the body, like the Heart Foundation, but some of them are other brands. Then you see them um, in playing cards, and I've got some here. So there's some playing cards with love hearts on them. Okay. Um, you've probably seen these ones. There's 32 of them apparently, so there's lots of them. They get used all the time. Then they're in books, and I've got some books here with love hearts on them. You guys probably have seen that book or your parents have seen that book around. Sorry? And you've probably seen the Magic School Bus, bus books. There's one about the heart where they go inside the heart. And this is another story book we had at home about glass hearts. Okay? And then they started putting them in movies as well. 
Anyone know what that movie is? What's that one? Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, the Queen of Hearts. Yeah. And anyone know this movie? You guys probably wouldn't, but your folks might. Recognise this movie? Had Meg Ryan and... and um, what's the name? Tom Hanks, that's right. Tom Hanks in it. Sleepless in Seattle, another one. Then they started putting them on buildings. I mean, that's an old building, so that looks like it's been there for a long time. So there, yeah. But is that really what a heart is? No. What's another type of heart? Probably see that I've got a model here. So this, this is, is not actually a human heart. This is actually a dog heart. But it's, it's similar if you look at it. Similar shapes. Okay. So in the Bible, they didn't really know... Um, they didn't really know a lot about the body in some respects and they thought everything, uh, a lot of life came through the heart, like all our thoughts came, came through our heart. They didn't know, there was no such thing, they didn't know what a brain was. They didn't have a word for it even, okay. So they thought all our thoughts came out of our hearts. And then also they, <clears throat> they, knew, that what, they knew there was a physical organ called, you know, that was a heart that... that um, sustained life basically and so it even talks about a heart attack in one area of the Bible I think it's in Samuel and then <clears throat> all our emotions came through our hearts so all our feelings of fear and, and um, worry and depression and all that and um, and all the choices we make all our desires that um, guide our choices that we make all came from the heart okay so the next one this is a verse in the Bible. Set, um, Andrew's already done this one. Create in me a pure heart. Now, do you know who said this one? This, you see it's in Psalm. Who do you think said it? Any ideas? Who wrote Psalms? Most of it. David. David. Yeah, King David. So King David said this after he'd done something really, really wrong. He was really sorry for it. And he asked for God to create in him a pure heart. Because our hearts can sometimes get, yeah, we can, they can get hardened in a way. From things that we do can make them a bit hard. Not physically, but spiritually, I guess. And um, so we have to try and um, get God to help us to, ch to change that, to give us new hearts. And there's another verse there that... Um, Guard your heart because it flows, it flows your whole, from it flows your whole life and that's in Proverbs. Okay, so the Bible believed, the Hebrews believed everything came out of your heart, your whole life. So basically if we um, make sure our thoughts, um, our bodies, our emotions and our choices are all guided by God, then we can, um, that's how we love the Lord with all your heart. So we're going to learn today about how we um, can get a new heart from God, how he can help us to give a new heart. But before you go, I want you all to jump up and down and do some star jumps for me. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Up, 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 up. Star jump. Quick, 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 quick. Energetic, come on. All right. You can jump over here. All right. You ready to? Yeah. What is that? I want you to have a listen. Can you hear your heart? Can you hear that? I think so. You think so? I hope so. <laughs> All right. Here we go. You might have trouble with that puffer jacket on. Oh, I hear it. You hear it? Good. Wow. Honey. That's you might need to take the hoodie off. You can hear it, can't you? Hear it? Yeah. Good. I can. You're alive. If you can't hear it, then that's a problem. See it? Excellent. Okay. You want to go? Mm -hmm. You don't want to go? All righty. You can head back to your seats now.
story. Uh, we're going to sing two more songs now. Our first one is Holy is the Lord. And then we're going to uh, finish with I Stand Amazed. So please stand now as we start this next song, Holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Holy is the Lord
Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart. Please bow your heads in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful day that you have blessed us with today. Thank you for the not-so-bright weather that we can still celebrate today. Thank you for giving us the energy to wake up, to have a smile on our faces, and to spend time with the church family. Uh, we especially play for Merlene today as she speaks your word today. May you give her the guidance. May you provide her... Uh, everything she needs uh, and we thank you for being our God for loving us and for forgiving us in all that we do Amen Louis Washkansky was a very sick man he had advanced diabetes, but above all, he had chronic heart failure, incurable heart disease. Louis lived in Cape Town in South Africa, and some of you who are a little older will probably remember his story. His doctor referred him to heart specialist, Dr. Christian Barnard. The year was 1967. And Dr. Barnard was ready to perform the first ever human-to-human -human heart transplant. Louis and his family agreed that he would be the first patient. Sometime later, Dr. Barnard was asked, was this a difficult decision? And he said, for a dying man, it is not a difficult decision because he knows he is at the end. And if a lion chases you to the bank of a river filled with crocodiles... You will leap into the water, convinced you have a chance to swim to the other side. And so it was with Louis, he chose to jump into the water. He survived for 18 days, regained consciousness, was able to speak with his family and reporters, and he died on the 21st of December 1967. Dr Barnard went on to persevere, to fine-tune his techniques and improve his surgical skills and continue to carry out these human-to-human -human heart transplants. Then we turn the clock forward to 1984, and again, some of you will remember, Dr Leonard Bailey also became known worldwide for infant heart transplants. These babies all suffered from hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And Dr Bailey, who passed away only a few years ago in 2019, was a Seventh-day Adventist doctor who was based at Loma Linda Medical Centre. And over the years, he was able to achieve a phenomenal 85% success rate for children under six months. Now, parents, can you imagine handing over your your baby under six months old to have a heart transplant. I can't imagine the stress and the fear and anxiety and all those other things that you would feel as a parent. Some of these infants survived well into adulthood. But, you know, it's also hard to imagine what a bittersweet experience it would be to know that your child had survived, but for your child to have a chance at life, someone else had lost their precious child and been prepared to let your child have their child's heart. 
In 2017, Loma Linda celebrated 50 years of transplants. 808 of the over 4,600 were heart transplants. You know, doesn't God give our medical people such wonderful skills? And who would have thought to even try to put a heart from one person into another person? But, you know, we're all suffering from heart disease and we've talked a little about it already this morning, but the offer of a transplant is there for all of us. Donating party, Jesus has already given his life and each one of us may experience a successful transplant surgery. We're going to read what God's word has to say about this and I'm using the NIV today. And we'll start in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. If you have your Bible or your devices, if you'd like to turn up with me and read these scriptures together, Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. And this, again, is a very familiar verse. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Then if we look in Psalms, and that's Psalm 51 and verse 10. Psalm 51 and verse 10. And David writes, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I think we can all echo David's prayer, can't we? And then over to the New Testament, to Galatians, where Paul writes in Galatians 2 verse 20. Galatians 2 and verse 20, where he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What wonderful scriptures. Easy to read, easy to be amazed at. But today I'd like you with me to stop and think and consider the implications of accepting this new heart. Let's just bow our heads. Father, as we open your word this morning and as we consider this new heart that you have promised to give us, we ask that you'll give us open hearts and open minds that we will receive the message that you have for us today. And please be one of our number, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to put your imagination into gear this morning. What if for 24 hours, just one day, 24 hours, Jesus wakes up in your bed? He walks in your shoes. He lives in your house. He goes to your job. He assumes your schedule. There's just one exception. Nothing about your life will change. Your health doesn't change. Your circumstances don't change. Your schedule doesn't change. Your problems aren't solved. Only one change occurs, and that is you have the heart of Jesus. Jesus lives your life with his heart for just one day and one night. So your heart can take the day off, and your life will be led by the heart of Jesus. His priorities will govern your actions, his passions will drive decisions, and his love will direct behaviour. What would you be like? Would anybody notice a difference? What about your family? Would they see something new? Your workmates? Would they sense a difference? Your children? Would they see something different? And what about people out there in the community? What about the less fortunate? Would you treat them the same way? Your friends, would they detect any difference? And then perhaps those that we don't get along quite so well with, would they see any difference in us? What difference would they see? Would they receive more mercy from Jesus' heart? And what about you? What difference would it make to you? Your stress level, your impatience, your temper, your mood swings, your attitude, would they change? Would you sleep better? Would you view the sunset and the sunrise differently? And what about your reaction to traffic delays? I know some mornings um, if I go down with Peter when he goes to work, South Road can be a bit like a car park. How do we react in those situations day to day? 
because they are irritating and frustrating, aren't they? Would you still be doing what you plan to do for those 24 hours? Think about your plans, your obligations, your appointments, your outings. If Jesus took over your heart, would anything change? Now keep thinking about this for a moment and I want you to adjust the lens of your imagination until you have a clear picture of Jesus leading your life and then hit the button. Frame the image. What's in your frame? Do you see evidence of Paul's words in Philippians 2 and verse 5? Philippians 2 and verse 5, Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Is that what you saw in your image? God's plan for us is nothing short of a new heart. So if we were a car, he would want to be in control of our engines and if we were a computer, he would want both the software and the hard drive. But we're people, we're humans, and God has given us a free will. We've been made in his image, and he wants to change our hearts. Paul again in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 23 and 24. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We hear people talk about attitude adjustments, don't we? Have you ever told your children they need an attitude adjustment? Sometimes we all need an attitude adjustment and that's what... Jesus wants to do for us. Paul challenges us to put on a new pattern of life like a new change of clothes. Now, when you put on some new clothes, do you take, leave the old ones on underneath? No, we take them off, don't we? And if they're half decent still, they might end up in the ADRA bin out in the foyer here. We exchange the old for the new. And that's what Paul is telling us here about our minds, our attitude. We discard the old self for a new self. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew records the commissioning of the disciples. Matthew chapter 10 and verses 1 to 4. He says, he called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Did you notice that Matthew attaches labels or tags to some of the names? Just for a few moments, I want to consider the label that Matthew gives to himself and also the one he gives to Simon. Now, we talk a lot about the publicans or the tax collectors, and we're well aware of the lack of regard amongst the Israelites for Jewish tax, or these Jewish tax collectors who were working for the Roman occupying forces. And um, these publicans were often renowned for taking as much as they could, extortion I guess we would call it, wouldn't we? And becoming quite wealthy as they served in their roles as puppets of the hated Roman government. And, of course, if someone didn't want to pay up, well, the Roman army was there to, to uh, use its techniques for helping people to cooperate. But Simon the Zealot, have you ever thought about that? What was a zealot? Well, Simon was at the other end of the political spectrum. The zealots stood against Rome and they acted as terrorists in an effort to overthrow these hated Roman rulers. And it was a good day for a zealot if he could step into a crowd and leave his dagger in a Roman collaborator such as Matthew. But here we have 
in Jesus' disciples, Matthew, the publican or tax collector, and Simon the zealot. But, you know, I think the greater miracle is that in all the story of the disciples, there's no record of any tension between Matthew and Simon. For sure, there's tension between some of the others and it's spelt out, but there's no record of any contention between these two. And so history demonstrates for us that with a new heart that Jesus gives us, things can change. From the scripture we've read today, it is very clear that God's plan is for us to be just like Jesus to visit God's transplant ward where he will give us a new heart, just like the heart of Jesus. In his book, Just Like Jesus, Max Licato suggests that if a sentence or two could capture God's desire for each one of us, it would be this. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. And the most amazing thing about all this is that God never ceases to love us, even if we reject the transplant he's given us and forget to take those necessary anti-rejection drugs, such as immersing ourselves in his word and spending time in prayer, he'll always make room for us to come back to the transplant ward for a tune-up. You know, sometimes we're a bit like Jenna. Jenna was a toddler, and Jenna loved to go to the park. My grandchildren like to go to the park. It's a nana, can we go to the park? Jenna loved the sandpit. Parents, do you remember when your children loved the sandpit? One day as she was playing in the sand, an ice cream man came into the park and Dad decided he'd get Jenna a treat. And he purchased an ice cream and when he turned around to give it to Jenna, here she is with her mouth full of sand. So where he'd planned to put something rather special, she'd put dirt. So, as any loving parent will do, Dad got the dirt out as much as he could, took her over to the water fountain and washed her mouth out and then gave her the ice cream. He says to her as he's washing out her mouth, spit out the dirt, honey. I've got something better for you. God wants us to spit out the dirt, but sometimes I'm suspicious that we're a bit reluctant. We like the dirt, don't we? If we're honest with ourselves, don't we sometimes like the dirt and we're reluctant to part with it? Then you start to think about that dirt. Prejudice, bitterness, dishonesty, unforgiveness, immorality, greed. God wants them gone. He wants us to be just like Jesus. And we often hear people say, but... I can't help this nasty temper. My grandfather had it. My father had it. I come by it honestly. Or it would be more likely for me to say, I'm pessimistic. That's just how I am. And so we could go on. An Adventist Review article caught my attention some years ago. It was entitled Wrestle in Prayer. And it included a story told by Anne Graham Lotz, who is the daughter of Billy Graham. And she was at a national prayer conference and one of her pastor friends came up to her and handed her a piece of paper. And he said, I want you to read this through prayerfully three times. And so later on, when she was in a quiet place and had the time, Anne read through what she'd been given. And after she'd read it through the first time, she found herself thinking, well, Lord, these are serious sins, but not much of it applies to me. And then she remembered that her friend had said not once, but three times. So later she read it again, and by the time she'd finished the second time, she began to think, hmm, some of this is me. And by the time she'd finished reading it the third time, God had shown her that she was actually guilty of all of them. And she says, I took the list very seriously and spoke to God with daily tears of repentance. And finally he broke my heart and said, OK, Anne, now I can trust you with greater things. So this is the list. Ingratitude, failure to thank God for his blessings or answers to prayer. Neglect of Bible reading, going for a day or days without reading my Bible or reading it without remembering what I read. Unbelief, 
I don't believe God will give me what he's promised because he hasn't given it to me yet. Prayerlessness. I offer God spiritual chatter, fantasy, wishful thinking or daydreaming as prayer. I often pray without fervent, focused faith. Pride. I secretly believe I'm better than someone else. I'm offended when people say I'm wrong. Envy. I am jealous of those who seem more recognisable than me. I struggle when I hear someone else praised. Critical spirit. I find fault with others because they don't measure up to my standards. Disparagement. I tell the truth about a person with the intention of causing people to think less of him or her. Lying. I have sought to impress someone with something that wasn't the whole truth or was an exaggeration of the truth. Hypocrisy. I pretend to be something I'm not. Temper. I've lost patience with a child, a co-worker, a friend, a spouse, a staff member or another person that I have spoken to with cross words. Arrogance. I have accepted God's forgiveness while refusing to forgive myself or someone else. I found that list rather sobering. What about you? If you'd like a copy, there'll be some on the table up the back there as you go out this morning. We need specialist help, don't we? Our attitudes, our selfishness, our inability to forgive, our grumpiness, the transplant room is waiting. And if we say things like, that's just how I am, get used to it, or I can't change, whatever it might be, then I believe we're limiting God's power in our lives and denying that we believe and accept his promises and the counsel he's given us in his, our word, in his word. In fact, we're a bit like the elderly lady who back uh, at the turn of the 20th century was living in a small town in Ireland and near the seashore. And she was known as being wealthy, but she was a bit stingy. And everyone in the village was surprised. Electricity came to the area and she was one of the first to sign up. And, of course, people had to pay to have it connected. And several weeks after the installation, a meter reader knocked on her door and he said, um, is your electricity working well? Oh, yes, she says, very well. And he scratched his head and he said, well, can you please explain something to me? Your meter shows hardly any usage. Are you sure you're using your power? Oh, yes, she said. Each evening, I turn on the lights when the sun sets, just long enough to light my candles, and then I turn it off again. <laughs> we may smile or laugh at this dear old lady, but when we choose to remain how we are, we're a bit like her. God's power's connected, but we have to have that switch flicked and leave it on for it to make a difference. Remember we read earlier in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then also that scripture in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ellen White's little book, Steps to Christ, pages 69 and 70, says this, Do you ask, how am I to abide in Christ? In the same way you received him first. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him. You gave yourself to God to be his holy, to serve and obey him, and you took Christ as your saviour. You could not yourself atone for your sins or change your heart, but having given yourself to God, you believe he, for Christ's sake, did all this for you. By faith you became Christ's and by faith you are to grow up in him by giving and taking. You are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements and you must take all. Christ, the fullness of all blessing to abide in your heart to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. And this paragraph is one of my favourites. Very practical. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. 
I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service, abide with me, and let all my work be right in you. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be moulded more and more after the life of Christ. What wonderful, practical and simple counsel. We often hear the expression, he or she only thinks about themselves. And we all know people like that. And we all have a rather strong me first streak in us. And when we think only about ourselves, our minds are turned away from Jesus. So why do we so often think only about ourselves? Well, I'd like to put to you that it's because Satan continually puts forth an effort to get us to do just that. He watches for his opportunity to distract us. And when we're not alert and thinking about our heart transplant or we've neglected the anti-rejection drugs, maybe it becomes easy for us to become overwhelmed by the cares of life, the pleasures of the world, perplexities, sorrows, the faults of others and even our own faults and imperfections. But we mustn't let Satan distract us like this. Remember the old saying, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. We know this is what he wants to do. So really there's no need for us to be overwhelmed. Jesus has taken care of our faults and weaknesses and if they continually come back and feel overwhelming, continue to take them to God in prayer because he's our strength. Remember Paul's words, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me. We have to learn to rest in him for he's able to keep what we've committed to him. What did the disciples have to say about Jesus? Because they knew him better than anyone else when he lived here on earth. Peter in 1 Peter 1.19 says he was a lamb without blemish or defect. And John in 1 John 3.5 says that he appeared so he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. So I want you to use your imaginations again. Think about Jesus' time on earth. Imagine you're able to be there on the hillside the day he feeds the 4,000. You'll remember the Bible story. It's found in Matthew 15. See Jesus and the disciples surrounded by thousands of people. They've been there for three days. If they brought food with them, it's well gone by now. And they've been drinking in every word that Jesus has been speaking. He's been healing the sick. He's been talking to the children. He doesn't want to send them home with empty tummies. He doesn't want them to faint or collapse on the way home. And so he says to the disciples, we need to feed them before they go home. Some of them have got a long way to go. They might collapse. And the disciples, can't you just see them looking at each other and saying, where are we going to find food out here to feed all these people? But Jesus calmly asks what they have. And then he tells the crowd to sit down. He blesses the food they've found, breaks the loaves. Is there a shortage? There are leftovers. Scripture records no hustle, bustle, anxiety on the part of Jesus. He's concerned about the welfare of the people and he knows his father will provide. Some years ago, while we were living at Emerald in Queensland, we had a Stormco team come through. And they, on Sabbath, were telling us some of their experiences. And one young lady was telling us about how they put on a barbecue in a small western Queensland town. And lots more people turned up than they expected. And, in fact, more than they had food for. It was a sausage sizzle. And the last sausages were taken from the barbecue and they looked and there were still all these people waiting for food. What were they going to do? And one of the team turned around and the barbecue was full of sausages. Now you might say someone saw what was happening and quickly found some sausages and put on the barbecue, but those young people firmly believed that God had provided that food. Is this possible? Do we limit God's power by our lack of faith? 
I think we do. Now I want you to wind the clock forward and imagine the night of Jesus' betrayal. We know the events that have led up and now Jesus has been praying, the disciples went to sleep and now they're heading up to meet Judas and the crowd that have come to take Jesus. I'm not sure what Peter was doing with the sword but we know he had one and he used it very effectively. What did Jesus do? Was there any, as recorded, was there any reprimand? Was there any anxiety? Jesus just calmly told him to put it away. And what did he do? Put his hand and healed the ear. Did Jesus have any grounds to be a bit agitated and a bit stressed? I would say yes. But no, he's calm. This was part of his purpose. He'd spent his time with his father in prayer and now it was time for him to go out and meet what he'd come to do to give his life for us. We too have a purpose as followers of Jesus. We're his representatives and he's promised us a heart transplant. When we have that transplant and commit to taking those anti-rejection drugs, we can be his representatives truly. Dwight Nelson tells the story of Edwina Humphrey Flynn. Now, Edwina is a classically trained vocalist who attended the Juilliard School in New York. And if you Google Edwina, you can hear her sing. And believe me, she's a black lady and she has a powerful voice. When she set out on her first day at the conservatorium, she prayed that God would come into her heart and that his light would shine out from her as she set out on this next stage of her life. And she off, went off to catch the subway. One day sometime later she had some time off work and decided to go in and put in some extra practice. So she goes in, finds an empty studio and begins her vocal exercises. About halfway through her time she hears loud voices out in the corridor. And next thing, the door to the studio where she is bursts open and these young people, four of them I think it was, come into the room and one of them says, I knew I'd find you here. And she was puzzled. She didn't know who these young people were. But as the story unfolds, these young people were heavy, heavily into the occult and they had actually been in the process of discussing black magic versus white magic. And Edwina wanted to know what it had to do with her. And this same young man responded by saying that he had seen her get off the train and come out of the subway that first morning. And as he had watched her, she was surrounded by a circle of light. Remember what she would prayed? And as she walked, she was walking into the light. She didn't know what to say. But then she said, well, how did you know it was me here in this studio practising? He said, because that same light was coming out from under the door. And I knew it was you that was in here. Now, that was where Dwight ends the story, so we don't know what happened and what discussion ensued. But what an amazing story. And that makes me think, what sort of light or atmosphere surrounds me? What sort of light or atmosphere surrounds you? What do other people see or feel every day as we go about our activities? Do those around us, not just those who know us well, sense that we have the atmosphere of heaven surrounding us? Do we sometimes go and start out a bit grumpy? Are we abrupt and short with people? If we find ourselves like this, maybe it's time to up the dosage of those anti-rejection drugs. Here's a quote from the 1986 devotional book entitled Reflecting Christ, which is taken from the white writings of Ellen White. And it says, The religion of Jesus softens whatever is hard and rough in the temper and smooths whatever is rugged and sharp in the manners. It makes the words gentle and the demeanour winning. Let us learn from Christ how to combine a high sense of purity and integrity with sunniness of disposition a kind, courteous Christian is the most powerful argument that can be produced in favour of Christianity. Our hearts seem so far from his. He is pure 
We are often greedy. He is peaceful. We are often hassled. He's purposeful. We get distracted. He's pleasant and sometimes we're just the opposite. He is spiritual, but we're earthbound. The distance between our hearts and his seems to be immense. But when we accept him as our personal saviour, we've been already got our new heart and we've been discharged from the transplant ward. We have a successful transplant. So will you with me today determine to not deny God's power to change our hearts, to continue with those anti-rejection drugs of Bible study and prayer to keep that new heart in good shape. May our daily or maybe more often prayer be create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We've already sung two lines, the chorus of one of my favourite scripture songs. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mould me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. May the light of the presence of Jesus surround each one of us, that others may see that we have visited the transplant ward and have become just like Jesus. This morning uh, is goodness of God. Please join us. Running 
Father in heaven, we thank you that you are faithful to each one of us and that you are good to us. And Lord, we want to rededicate our hearts to you this morning. We thank you for that promise of a new heart. And we thank you again for Jesus and his death for each one of us. We ask that you'll help us to determine in you this morning to live every aspect of our lives for you. Be with us during the coming week. Watch over us and bring us back here again to worship and community together again next Sabbath, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. You're welcome to stay. We're just going to reprise some of that last song. Otherwise, a blessings to you. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. Every breath. 